Welcome to CSIS Online. Join us as we bring together top experts and thought leaders to discuss innovative ideas and real world solutions to global issues from security and economics to technology and environment. Tune in and be part of the conversation. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for this report launch event on uh, a, a document which was just released yesterday on the CSIS homepage called Building International Support for Taiwan. My name is Jude Blanchett, and I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. I'm joined in co-hosting this event with my Freeman Chair colleague, Lily McElwee, and joining us from the Brookings Institution is Ryan Haas, who is the director of its John L. Thornton China Center and the Chun Fu and Cecilia Yen Ku Chair in Taiwan Studies. Um, over the last, uh, or over eight months of the last year, we convened a, a really fantastic group of China, Asia, and Taiwan experts from around the globe to discuss political and narrative strategies for widening and deepening the international community's engagement directly with Taiwan in an ultimate effort to bring more stability and therefore peace into the Taiwan Strait. Um, normally, we would have a group of uh, DC-based experts do this, and, and there are many valiant efforts that try to capture the views and, and push policy forward here from a US perspective. But what we did in this instance is we wanted to hear from voices across uh, the, the international landscape with an eye towards what would a coalition of like-minded states who have a direct stake in peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, what, what, what do we all need collectively to push forward our engagement in Taiwan? And so to, to that end, we uh, invited voices from Australia, Canada, France, Germany, India, Japan, Nigeria, South Korea, and, and the United Kingdom to, to join us. Uh, and today we're going to discuss the main findings of that report, but more importantly, have a, a discussion uh, with some of the task force members. One uh, note I should make just before we get into this is um, the report itself and the main findings of it are not a consensus document. In other words, uh, we very much drew on the insights and opinions of all of the task force members, um, but we uh, the, the ultimate result of this is the views of Lily, Ryan, and myself uh, alone but we gave all task force members the opportunity to append their own statements at the end of the report, either disagreeing, agreeing, or just picking an amplification of something they thought was uh, insufficiently attended in the report or just didn't have the space to do it. So this report could not have happened without all of the insights uh, of all of our task force members, but uh, any individual opinion in the report is uh, just those of the main uh, authors. Also really delighted that in addition to Ryan and Lily, we have two uh, colleagues, uh, friends, and fellow task force members joining us for the discussion. Uh, Manoj K. Romani, who's the chairperson of the Indo-Pacific Research Program at the Takshashila Institution, and, and really proud to say a non-resident at, at the Freeman Chair. Uh, and Yanko Ortel, who's the Asia Program Director and Senior Policy Fellow at the European Council on, on Foreign Relations. So just two fantastic voices in the broader debate uh, on China and, and Asia strategy. So um, just again for logistics, uh, we're going to, Lily, Ryan, and I will run through very briefly the report's main findings, and then we'll open it up for discussion with Yanka and Manoj. Ryan, if, if you don't mind, I might briefly turn to you for some, some introductory thoughts before we dig into the report. Well, thank you, Jude. And it's really, it's been a pleasure to be a participant in this task force with you, Lily, and the rest of the team. So I wanted to, to start by thanking you. Uh, but I also wanted to do a public service announcement to friends around the world, which is to remind that today is Valentine's Day. So happy Valentine's Day to anyone who may have forgotten. The, as, as Jude mentioned, the report really inverts the discussion from how it uh, has occurred over the course of my professional career in government and in think tanks, where most often, Many Americans are, are seeking to transmit uh, insights, knowledge, recommendations, requests to people around the world on issues related to Taiwan. This project was the exact opposite. It was intended to provide us an opportunity to listen uh, to the viewpoints, the perspectives, the recommendations and requests from the rest of the world uh, for how the United States and Taiwan can best uh, frame these issues in ways that help build coalitional support for Taiwan and for the shared objective of preserving peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. 
And I think that this is, uh, you know, part of a recognition uh, that the situation in the Taiwan Strait is not going to be determined by an arithmetic, arithmetic uh, count of bullets, missiles, planes, uh, or ships, but also by credible warnings to Beijing of the global consequences of attempting to alter the status quo in the Taiwan Strait through through unilateral uh, uh, force or or pressure. And so. Uh, this is it's been a, a very rich series of discussions that uh, are reflected in the report. Uh, we're going to go through each of the takeaways, so I, I won't uh, steal too much of the thunder, but I did want to just sort of offer one macro uh, thought, which is that one of the real lessons I took away from these discussions as I reflected upon them is that in many parts of the world, Taiwan is not a morality play. Uh, oftentimes in Washington, we think of the United States and Taiwan as the good guys, China as the bad guys, and it's, uh, you know, it's a, uh, a fight between good and evil. That isn't how uh, uh, this issue is viewed in many other parts of the world where the narrative is genuinely contested. And I think as a consequence of that, unless the United States and its partners around the world become more active and effective at building a case uh, for the need for coalitional support for Taiwan, it'll be harder uh, to deter China from taking unilateral steps to try to tilt the status quo in their preferred direction. Uh, the, the other big sort of, um, um, you know, smack to the face that, that came through in all these conversations is that a broad interest-based approach has much more purchase than an ideological framing of, of issues related to Taiwan. So with that, I will uh, turn it back to you, Jude, so that we can march through some of the takeaways and move into our discussion. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and if I could ask we the, the first slide to come up. Uh, so um, we had six main uh, findings or recommendations uh, or conclusions, I should say, from, from the, the bulk of the discussions, which we'll quickly run through. Um, the, the first is probably obvious to the outside world, but not always obvious to, to those of us here in Washington, D.C., which is um, the way Taiwan is thought of and discussed and how uh, nation states think about their interests vis-a-vis -a, -vis a Taiwan or, or the Taiwan Strait um, do not completely comport with the, the consensus view here in Washington. Um, and this is, I think, two points to raise here. Number one is um, there is a genuine organic reaction in, um, in much of the international community to what they see as U.S. actions, which in their own way are uh, stirring the pot. Um, that are subtractive from uh, peace and stability uh, in Taiwan. And I think our, our view is whether these are right or wrong is slightly beside the point. Um, there is uh, there is in discussions um, clearly a view that whether it is uh, things like the, the trip by then uh, Speaker, uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan and the subsequent Chinese reaction, um, it is not a, a compelling, clear story necessarily in much of the international community uh, that um, uh, China is the only one um, that is contributing to some uh, instability in the region. Now, it's important to also mention that even if there are some organic impressions looking at U.S. policy, these are clearly amplified by a very, very aggressive uh, Chinese propaganda campaign in the international space that is looking to distort the motivation of U.S. actions and even the result of these to make these seem um, uh, I think wildly and, and, and intentionally uh, destabilizing uh, to the region, uh, whether these are narratives about that the United States is looking to, quote, use Taiwan as a cudgel uh, or use Taiwan to split China, uh, as well as broader narratives about this, uh, this Chinese narrative campaign around uh, a spread of a Asian NATO, which is this view that the United States through uh, security agreements and minilateral security agreements uh, like uh, the, the Quad or, or um, AUKUS is somehow looking to bring uh, war to uh, the Indo-Pacific. As Beijing says, it has done in Europe by, again, according to Beijing's own propaganda line, um, pushing NATO right up to Putin's doorstep and essentially inviting or, or precipitating attack. Uh, again, our, our view is very different uh, on how we see the world, but it's important to reflect uh, reflect these views. And so um, as we try to build international support for Taiwan, it's going to become important that we uh, understand just how much of a gap there exists uh, between uh, the view here in the United States and where it rests in some global capitals. Uh, next slide, please. 
I think re related to this is uh, a, a view amongst many in, in international capitals um, that the way that the United States is discussing or attempting to um, highlight some of the risks uh, around instability in the Taiwan Strait uh, are imperfectly landing. And I say imperfectly because some task force members did raise the, the point that some of the warnings by the United States about a possible um, Chinese attack on Taiwan, whether it's uh, next year or 2027, has galvanized or started conversations in capitals, especially in Europe, that might not have organically taken place. Uh, and so in raising the threat awareness of a possible Chinese kinetic attack to, to annex Taiwan, um, that is motivating conversations which would have dragged um, had those warnings not become uh, uh, louder. At the same time, I think other task force members mentioned that um, what seems to be a, a very militaristic framing of, of the Taiwan issue, essentially boiling down uh, our, our, our interest in, in Taiwan simply to uh, stopping a, a Chinese invasion, um, is having the unintended of a consequence of making it politically more challenging for uh, elected leaders in, in potential coalition countries to, to do more with Taiwan. And I think the reason is, if, if Taiwan is essentially, as the infamous economist cover called it, the most dangerous place on earth, uh, then it makes it harder for especially medium and smaller powers uh, to try to uh, summon the political will to say, yes, we should do more with, with Taiwan because, of course, voters reasonably think, well, why would we want to do that if, if this is really an issue that is moving towards a conflict between the United States and China? Now, again, this is not the end result here. This is really just the starting point for a discussion, because I think where this needs to go is then highlighting the, the importance of stronger coalitional voices on Taiwan as really a key uh, deterrent value rather than necessarily strapping themselves uh, to a global conflagration, actually making the point that Clear, bolder statements in support of Taiwan uh, might actually have the effect of, of, of uh, decreasing the likelihood of conflict by uh, sending stronger deterrent signals uh, to Beijing. But let me end just by saying I think this is a point where there was – this is why these sorts of global discussions are important because it was a – not a, a, a an, an either-or, but a, a, a but-and where we have to recognize the complexity of narratives around uh, Taiwan. Uh, so, Lily, why don't I turn it over to you for the next uh, few takeaways? Great. Thank you, Jude. Glad to be here. So our third takeaway was that when we're looking for narratives that can gain broad based support in the international system, um, it's important to speak to the ways in which Taiwan and peace and stability in, in and around the Taiwan Strait implicate countries' interests. So the task force urged that more be made of First, the tangible benefits to be derived from positive relations with Taiwan. So, you know, Taiwan's role as a semiconductor production hub is important. It's vital to the global economy, but it's beyond that. You know, Taiwan can be a partner and is a partner to G7 economies and economies in the developing world across a wide range of domains. And so our task force discussions discussed during the COVID pandemic, Taiwan was a substantial contributor of medical equipment to countries, for example, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, Taiwan firms have made major investments and been job creators in places like the United States, Germany, India, Japan, and um, many countries uh, and, and, and Europe as well have, have benefited from uh, Taiwan's expertise in countering disinformation, for example, to better understand foreign manipulation, information manipulation efforts. So these are ways in which it's important to emphasize that Taiwan can be a reliable and valuable partner to countries um, that in ways that advance their own interests. And the second point that we wanted to make here that came out of, came out of our task force discussions was that peace and stability in and around the Taiwan Strait itself is critical from a developmental and economic perspective. Um, Taiwan, the Taiwan Strait is a major waterway in global trade, and there really is no clean path to any potential near-term annexation attempt by Beijing at Taiwan, especially given the strong sense of Taiwanese identity and the strong support for status quo um, among the Taiwan electorate. So that's an important point to emphasize in conjunction with the fact that any interruption of the free flow of commerce um, would create extremely costly and widespread disruptions to global trade and semiconductor supply chains. 
which would have major economic ramifications for the global economy. And Bloomberg did some great estimates of this recently. But the more Taiwan itself is viewed as a partner, and it's emphasized how important peace and stability in and around the Taiwan Strait are for countries' own interests, you know, whether that's supply chain security, distribution of medical supplies, infrastructure construction, the more invested other countries and the more invested states will be in its security. And um, this really points to an uncomfortable truth that I hope we can um, discuss more. And Ryan mentioned it briefly that came out of our discussions was that many in many regions, particularly in the global south, shared democratic values would be an insufficient motivating factor to compel countries and their respective private sectors to accept greater friction with China. Um, so, you know, the discourse is more interest based than value based. Um, now, one important caveat to that is that that isn't universally true. And and some of our discussions, we, you know, we we came away with the fact that in a lot of advanced democracies, you know, Taiwan's status as a healthy, stable, resilient democracy is something that does galvanize international attention and, and attention and support for Taiwan. So. That's, you know, that's an important caveat, but when we're thinking of, about broad based engagement, it's important to emphasize uh, the, the tangible interest aspect, as well as the shared democratic values um, in, in galvanizing more attention and support. Next slide, please. So our fourth point is related to the third one, and it's the idea, you know, so all countries, G7 economies, developing countries have an interest in stability, which is critical to global prosperity. And regional stability in Asia plays a enormous role in global in global prosperity. The world is home to two thirds of the world's population contributes contributed about 70% to global growth last year. And the upward trajectory of the region relies on the continued free, free flow of goods um, for which peace and stability uh, in and around Taiwan will be critical. So although that Beijing likes to suggest that Taiwan is a subordinate issue within its international relationships, it's important to counter that narrative and emphasize that actually Taiwan is a key actor in the region whose prosperity and security are vital for international interests. The more Taiwan is viewed itself as vital to regional peace and stability on its own terms, the more invested other stakeholders would be in its uh, security. And one thing that came out of our discussions, which I, I hope maybe Yanka can touch on earlier, is that we've already begun to see that dehyphenization more, more so in certain regions than others, and Europe has been ahead um, on on that on that matter. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Ryan for our final two conclusions. Well, thank you, Lily. And uh, the the next uh, conclusion is that one of the lessons we drew is that experts around the world are focused on Taiwan issues, but the the general public and leaders in many countries around the world just have to contend with a a range of domestic and global challenges. And Taiwan doesn't always rise uh, to to the top of those challenges. And in the absence of directly engaging leaders and, and broad publics in other countries, leaders are susceptible to uh, having the only interaction with Taiwan be when they meet with their Chinese counterparts. And they're ill-equipped to, to deal with or, or interpret, translate uh, the, the messages that they're receiving from their Chinese counterparts. So getting more uh, of a discussion going around the world on why Taiwan matters and what the rest of the world can do to ensure that Taiwan and the Taiwan Strait remain uh, stable and prosperous would be time well spent um, for, for the broader objective of pre preserving peace and stability. Now, specific to this, there is a discussion about what role international law can play uh, in providing a rationale or, or justification for for efforts to respond to uh, Chinese pressures short of the use of war uh, to achieve their objectives in the Taiwan Strait. So for example, if, uh, if China were to act in a way that uh, Russia did towards Crimea in 2014, if they were to launch a blockade or imposition of control over uh, airspace or, uh, or waters uh, that are um, controlled by Taiwan today, or if there is a forcible effort to disarm offshore islands uh, around Taiwan, what would the international legal justification be for uh, a coalition response? And, and this is an area that uh, the task force identified as requiring more work. Uh, Article 39 of the United Nations Charter may provide a starting point uh, for us to begin to think uh, about this, but uh, this is something that, uh, that was certainly flagged. The final takeaway uh, is a reminder that a steady determined posture by the United States is important for enabling greater 
and more durable buy-in from the rest of the world uh, for supporting Taiwan. In other words, if, if America's determination on Taiwan wavers, it's likely that others around the world will, will grow more cautious in offering their support for, for Taiwan as well. And this is an important reminder uh, for us in Washington, particularly as we enter into an election year in 2024, uh, where the United States is actively debating uh, its role in the world, uh, its posture going forward on issues such as Taiwan. It's going to, th these debates will, will occur this year in the United States, but they will also induce, induce an impulse towards caution in many other capitals around the world. And this means that American policymakers will need to be patient uh, as we uh, try to push forward this conversation and, and mature it in the, in the months and years to come. But with that, uh, I will turn it back to you, Jude, to bring us into the discussion. Wonderful. Thank you, Ryan and Lily. Um, let me now bring in uh, Manoj and Yanka, who were two um, it, uh, the task force members who joined us throughout the conversations. And and just to uh, viewers, if, if you go to the CSIS um, website, you'll see on the homepage, there's a link to the report and there will be a full list of, of all the task force members. So this is just a, a, a slice, but it's a wonderful slice nonetheless, and really delighted you're both here. Manoj, maybe I'll, I'll first start with you. So High level thoughts um, uh, on the state of the discussion on Taiwan in your neck of the woods. And then also, I thought your appendix had some important points on the interest versus um, values component of, of the Taiwan discussion. So please, Manoj. Yeah, thank you so much, Jude. And I'm really happy to see the report uh, out. It looks fantastic. Um, look, I concur with the broad trust of the report. Um, and like you said, uh, I think that. The recommendation acknowledges the importance of adopting an interest-based approach to the Taiwan issue rather than an, ide rather than an ideological one. Um, it also talks about sustained diplomacy and building a broad coalition, which is a long, painful process. It's not going to be easy. So to that extent, I agree. Um, on some of the recommendations, particularly around, say, the first one, which talks about how um, the rest of the world doesn't necessarily see Washington's role the, the way Washington sees itself. I mean, I'm not sure if, if, if that's exactly how uh, India also perceives uh, the way the report describes it. I mean, to me, uh, I think as aggressive as Beijing has been around Taiwan uh, in India, uh, those efforts have backfired uh, and they've actually created far more public discourse, which is favorable to Taiwan. Um, it, it may not have moved necessarily the policy needle in that, end, but I think it has created significant public discourse. Uh, I think the other aspect is to think about is when we talk about uh, actions that need to contribute to peace and stability. So it's all well and good for all of us to be on the same page when it comes to not discussing sovereignty, but, uh, but rather focusing on interest and peace and stability. But what exactly are these actions that contribute to peace and stability? Uh, I presume that uh, there'd be a very different view in Washington, in Brussels, in Delhi, uh, in some of the African capitals as to what constitutes actions that you know, lead to peace and stability. Uh, is the visit of a parliamentary delegation uh, contributing to peace and stability? Um, is pushing for Taiwan's participation in certain international agencies uh, escalating or contributing to peace and stability? Uh, and uh, you have to take into context, obviously, the fact that Beijing is obviously pushing the needle uh, away from each of these steps, uh, you know, categorizing even what were ordinary engagements as escalatory increasingly. So I, I think that it's important that the while we come to the same page and agree that we need to do some things to contribute to peace and stability, it's important to iron out what exactly each perceives as those actions and then accordingly try to build consensus uh, around those. And again, uh, if that happens uh, with a broad-based group of countries, it's helpful. Um, the other thing is that I think uh, one of the points that I think we discussed during the sessions was that it's important for, uh, say, different sectors across different countries, uh, but also globally, to do some sort of tabulations of what escalations within the Taiwan Strait mean economically for their sectors and their industries, but also for countries. Uh, and I think that sort of cost calculation is really important, not just at a global scale, which I know CSIS has done a report, uh, but at even national scales for policymakers to get an understanding of what kind of uh, challenges economically they might end up encountering. It could potentially galvanize uh, a greater desire for action on peace and stability. Um, very quickly on, on India, uh, look, I, I mean, from an Indian perspective, uh, Taiwan has not been a big part of our sort of foreign policy discourse uh, historically, but I think it's changing. We're seeing a far more active India 
uh, on this issue uh, one a couple of examples that i can give you uh, you know uh, are the fact that you know very recently three former indian armed forces uh, service chiefs visited taiwan uh, for a dialogue uh, that's quite a strong signal from an indian perspective um, india is also increasingly engaging with taiwan independently of china to, uh, in the context of its desire to boost technological self sufficiency or self reliance but also become a key part of uh, global value chains um and i'll end with uh, you know a, a quite stark example of that is the fact that uh, late last month uh, foxconn ceo was conferred with the padma bhushan which is the third highest civilian award in india it came out of the blue uh, but it just tells you how one of the recommendations that you have in the rec- report about the hyphenating taiwan and china that's happening and but and that happens once you believe once you build in some of these organic equities between countries where their interests align So I think if that's where we focus, we'll probably be much more. Our actions will be probably much more fruitful. I'll stop with that. Wonderful. Thank you, Manoj. Excellent comments and thoughts. Uh, Yanka, over to you, please. Thank you, and thank you to all of you for convening this task. I think it was a, a very well worth endeavor, and and something that has been kind of lacking in the discourse so far. And I agree with Manoj that I would agree with most of the things that are in the report. Very representative of the discussions that took place. Um, maybe I can, because you said we're we're a slice. I'm happy to be a slice of the conversation. So I will I will be the European slice of the conversation here. Um, and just as sort of to get a bit of a flavor for where the conversation is in Europe at the moment on this, which is sort of not reflected in detail in the report because you don't go into the specific regions so much. Um, it is definitely true that Europeans um, say more. than ever before and I've been in this business for um more than 15 years now they say more than ever before that they care about Taiwan but if you then dig a little bit deeper and they care about Taiwan security then what they're actually worried about is not Taiwan they're worried about the United States and so I think that first point in terms of the messages of the United States and the messages that the United States sends that is for me the t- key takeaway at the moment um this is more about us consistency than anything else this is more about the us than it is about taiwan in a weird way it's more about the us than it is about china um for the europeans because other the otherwise um the conflict is still too far away um the real threat perception the threat perception that um Lydia, you also talked about that is supposed to be conveyed as well to europeans it still doesn't resonate yet in all of the european capitals um it resonates sort of in an abstract way but it doesn't resonate in a concrete way while there's a war on your doorstep that with actual consequences that are very immediate and that are very direct and that makes it really difficult because um a taiwan a potential taiwan conflict is kind of competing with an actual ukraine war at the moment in terms of political attention that can be spent on the problem and even thinking it through So yes of course focusing on interests then would be the solution to that but i think even the interests argument is a bit tricky because the conversations are still sort of in the abstract to me one of the biggest problem of the conversation that we're facing at the moment is that we're still talking about a taiwan scenario in the european debate well it's actually taiwan scenarios and hundreds of them that we would actually need to talk through it's not the one scenario that we could possibly be facing that has kind of a, a logical way of responding to it but it's all of the different ones that we actually need to all game through figure out find solutions for find pathways for because what we're now at is the taiwan scenario the response is well these are unimaginable consequences for the global economy and if the consequences are unimaginable if you talk about you know double digit hit to global gdp if you talk about everyone is going to be hit well then it creates a huge collective action problem because then you know no one's going to do anything about it um if it's going to hit everyone and it's going to be so terrible then the unimaginableness of this makes it also um unoperationalizable i don't think that's a you uh, american word but i don't care um you know what i mean right it makes it uh, impossible to find political answers to this um you can just park the problem then and put it in the it's so terrible let's hope it doesn't happen um and if it happens we will find a solution for it or not um the problem is that actually because then you break it down to the multiple taiwan scenarios you will actually have probably the probability of having to deal with one of these taiwan scenarios that are imaginable um are very likely they're very real and they they could be happening actually very soon 
And because we haven't been able to actually differentiate between that, we're now in the zone where um, we actually aren't ready and aren't prepared for any of the gray zone activities, um, any of this that falls below the threshold of, of a kind of full invasion, a full war, a full-blown escalation between the United States and China around the Taiwan question. And I think that's where um, most of the attention should be laid at the moment in terms of not just talking about interests, but talking very specifically about very specific scenarios where also a pathway to a solution and a pathway to an answer can be provided of saying, well, yes, that's actually a problem that one can deal with. It's a problem that one can mitigate against. It is a problem that one can respond to um, because we're at the moment in Europe, I think, faced with a number of scenarios of global proportion that are all that all don't have a very good answer. Um, and it leads to the current, the motto of the Munich Security Conference that starts this week is lose, lose. Um, but it's also doom and gloom. You know, it, it, you don't find a way path forward to an actionable agenda in a doom and gloom setting. And I think this is where we need to move towards. Um, because at the moment, um, Lady, you pointed out, you know, making sure that Taiwan is perceived as a reliable and valuable partner, but it's it's seen as reliable and valuable, but not as essential at the moment um, in terms of all of the other things that are happening at the same time. The Ukraine conversation, the Ukraine war has changed some of the way in which Taiwan is being perceived. And I think we need to point out that in Eastern European countries, there is a definitely different change in the narrative, also a change in Taiwan policy that goes much deeper um, than in Western European countries, because the clear threat perception is a different one. Um, but the, we, we need to make sure that this doesn't stay a shallow sideline conversation, but is sort of, um, streamlined into the broader European, um, Western European discourse as well. I think one of the points that Ryan, you raised is the depth, um, of the knowledge on Taiwan. Um, I think that's one of the issues that I also found quite striking in all of the conversations in recent months. Um, we still have, you know, former German foreign ministers that are not entirely clear about what status Taiwan actually has for Germany, um, that are giving mixed signals on, on what this actually means. So being clear about what is actually allowed, what is not allowed, taking some of the scariness of the Taiwan conversation away. Um, it feels like territory where policymakers and business people all have to tread very carefully. Can we make that less dangerous for them? Less kind of thin ice that they tread on. And then to end with, I would say, um, you know, it is nice to have all these recommendations, and I agree with a lot of the things that are in the report. But then for me, the big question is now what? So what do we do with this? Uh, how do we move forward? And this is where I would like to kick it back to you, Jude, um, Lily, and, and Ryan, and say, you know, A, what are the what is the hope that you can send us in terms of consistency of the US agenda? Walk us through the kind of Biden and Trump scenarios that we are potentially going to face. And what does it mean? Um, how can you ensure the consistency here? And then maybe also, what are the expectations? Um, of the other players that are coming out of this administration in a difficult time that the U.S. faces itself, like in a, in a difficult situation. What would be a good Taiwan policy um, for Europeans um, from a Washington perspective? Do you actually agree? Um, do you have something that you can share on that front? Maybe I'll, I'll end on that um, and then we can start the discussion. A, a, a really... Uh, uh, thought-provoking set of remarks, and I, I appreciate Yanke, you throwing down the gauntlet of um, uh, let's turn uh, let's turn thought into action, um, and should say that there are no easy um, there's no easy answers to your really hard, good questions, and Manoj, you as well. I think the this issue of what are um, what are mathematically certain actions that will add to peace and stability. Is different is difficult when you're talking about deterrence and perceptions and how actions are filtered through a decision making process in Beijing that we're struggling increasingly to understand in, input and in, in, and output. Um, and Yanka, I think your point about U.S. consistency is um, and predictability is one that is unavoidable. And I keen to hear my other American colleagues uh, on here. I think we know the stakes. Um, but I think it's hard to make any promises or, or predictions here. Um, this is just the unfortunate reality that we face ourselves with, where we can imagine two very divergent or two or more very divergent paths of travel um, over over the next um, few years. I, I'll have I have one thought, and then keen to go to Lily and, and Ryan for for their uh, reactions to your really fantastic set of comments. Um, while I hear the point about the U.S. factor and U.S. Pre uh, predictability or, or the lack thereof, um, 
I would say if ever there was a time for uh, getting off the fences and really starting to show a, a, a higher risk tolerance and boldness um, by our partners, it would be right now. And I would say that Brian mentioned this earlier. I think we have so historically thought of cross-strait issues as having just a, a few key players of which the United States is one, of course, Taiwan and, um, uh, and, and China. But we're now seeing that this is truly a global issue. Uh, we all have a stake in uh, ensuring um, Taiwan's prosperity just for the by dint of its critical importance in global technology supply chains. And of course, we all have a direct stake in uh, the free flow of unimpeded commerce uh, through the waters in, in and around Taiwan. So just at base economic interests were, were all implicated and involved here. Um, and this is one where we're beyond the point where this is something that the U.S., you know, is quote unquote going to to fix. This is, we're in an entirely different world now in terms of China's power projection capabilities. Um, Taiwan is just a vastly more complex, vibrant, evolving democracy, which has, you, you know, an increasingly complex ecosystem of, of relationships. Um, the more that there is a coalitional approach to thinking about Taiwan now, um, I think it makes it marginally harder for dramatic course corrections um, by the United States uh, later on. So the more certain the path of coalitional travel that we can forge over the next you know, days, months, and, and year, I think this helps build some, at least some modicum of consistency here. And on a lot of these issues, when we're thinking about deterrence, whether this is Nyanka, something you and I have talked a lot about, thinking about the role of sanctions, um, where, when, and how those discussions of those by coalitional partners in the G7 can uh, send it an important deterrent signaling role when, where, and how uh, uh, European partners, uh, which are already doing this, but can do more in terms of their presence, uh, the physical military presence in the Indo-Pacific and doing that in a, in a balanced way that signals to, to China clearly that there are stakeholders beyond just the United States. Um, I think all those become important, but I just come down. I don't think there's going to be any formal mathematical formula we're going to find for solving this. I think it's going to be a lot of judgment. It's going to be a lot of careful thinking about which actions um, we think are genuinely additive to Taiwan's prosperity and security. I think we all know uh, um, when we see something that looks like it's more theater than uh, than substance. No one is saying congressional delegations are not important or that de parliamentary delegations aren't important. I think they are. I think showing up I think going to Taiwan is critical, seeing for your own eyes, having uh, discussions. But I think we also know when we see a congressional delegation that is more about uh, furthering someone's you know, political career than it is actually uh, 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 trying to ensure that we're sending the right, right deterrent signal. Um, so what, uh, uh, Lily, why don't I turn it over to you and then, and then Ryan for your own thoughts on this. Great, thanks Jude. Um, so I really appreciated both of your comments and I wanna try to tie them together because I was struck, uh, Yanka, when you were talking about the conversation in Europe being about, you know, the one Taiwan scenario. And it seems to me like, you know, when we're talking about what can Washington do, where more education is needed, that that is an easy path to educate about what are the various scenarios, the range of scenarios here um, that, you know, th that could uh, come about. And that would have the effect um, uh, potentially of dialing down the the, the temperature um, to to draw broader engagement with you know the types of consequences for the global economy that might be uh, slightly different than a than, than an invasion all out war scenario, and then I want to tie it to something that Manoj mentioned, which I um, which is more research for for us or for anyone who wants to do it, um, but I think it's really really a, an interesting idea to kind of look at. Um, sector by sector, but also region by region, country by country, what would be the implications for their economic interests, their prosperity, their security, you know, tying that to the range of scenarios here. Um, so um, just to, to make clear, to make tangible what is what is the stake of each country in in this um, in, in Taiwan security, in peace and stability in Taiwan Strait? Because it's as you say, it's all well and good to say that. 
But what can really drive policy is having maybe a number, having you know a, a better sense of what the actual ramifications would be. So tying those two together, better education of a range of scenarios, but also better understanding of the economic um, and other ramifications, I think would help drive home the point, Yanka, you were saying um, that that Taiwan is seen as a reliable and valuable partner in Europe, but not a necessary partner. Maybe it would help drive home that necessary part as well. I'll turn it over to Ryan. Well, I will uh, pick up right where Lily stopped because Yanka, I think you've provided a useful and sort of piercing provocation for us. Um, but here's the reality. The, the reality is that if there is a crisis in the Taiwan Strait that impedes Taiwan's ability to export products to the rest of the world, the effects would be greater than the effect of the Ukraine war and COVID combined. And I, I just want that to sink in because no uh, community that is connected to the global economy would be spared from this effect. Uh, COVID was pretty bad. The war in Ukraine that, uh, that, that uh, is on Europe's footsteps and, and people are living through right now is horrible. Uh, if, if something happens in Taiwan, it would be worse than the, those two things combined. And so I don't think that in 2024, we can allow uh, for idle thinking that uh, Taiwan could be a localized issue and that Taiwan is reliable and dependable, but not essential, because it absolutely is. Uh, it's essential to every community connected to the global economy. So that that's the first thought. The second thought is that yes, you are absolutely right that uh, that the United States is exhibiting inconsistency. Uh, internal debates are affecting our external relations in ways that are harmful, I think, to America's long-term national security interests. Um, but the the one I guess note that I would offer uh, is that on the issue of Taiwan, over the past 45 plus years, even during the Trump administration, the first Trump administration, the United States had a consistent set of interests that guided its overall approach. Uh, and so the, the record of the 40, past 45 years allows us to reach the conclusion that we do know what our interests are in the Taiwan Strait, and that those interests have, up to this point, uh, been sort of the North Star guiding us. And our, and our foremost interest is preserving peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. I don't think that interest will wane or waver uh, depending upon who occupies the Oval Office. I also don't think that uh, issues of war and peace are issues that are left to one person alone uh, sitting by himself or herself in the Oval Office. And so we should have a, a little bit more uh, confidence in sort of the institutional checks and safeguards that exist and uh, America's long-term identification of its interests uh, as we sort of project forward into the future. Final thought uh, in, in response to the presentation. If we sort of think about Taiwan as like this big intractable problem, it, it, it's really hard to figure out what is the next step. Uh, and so I think that it's helpful for us to sort of try to break down and decompose what are practical things that can be done in the near and midterm to help push the ball forward. And I, I would offer uh, two or three quick ideas. The first is that we clearly need to close conceptual gaps in how we are thinking about Taiwan as an issue in Europe and the United States in India and, and elsewhere. Um, because one of the things that I've taken away from this is that there are, I mean, we are broadly aligned in, in our identification of our interests, but there are still conceptual gaps in how we're thinking about and talking about and acting on Taiwan. The second thought is that we need to find ways collectively to help Taiwan become the best version of itself. Uh, we know what Taiwan wants. They want dignity and respect on the world stage. They want to have a, a vibrant economy and they want to feel a sense of security. Uh, and it's important for us that that Taiwan uh, feels these things because a confident Taiwan is a stable Taiwan uh, that is less likely or less prone uh, to take actions that could could have destabilizing effects. And so it's in all of, all of our interest for uh, for Taiwan to to move in this direction and to feel confident about its future. And there are practical things that all 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 these parties can do uh, within the bounds of their existing policy that would be additive and supportive uh, of those objectives. And then the third uh, piece and final thought that I'll, I'll offer before I turn it back to Jude is that uh, I think it's really important that Beijing receive consistent, clear, coordinated messages from all of us who have a stake and interest in preserving peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, they need to hear in stereo uh, from all of us the priority that we place upon this issue uh, and uh, the degree of unblinking focus that we have on it. Uh, in order for them to draw accurate conclusions about uh, the risks uh, that they would attract if they were to take actions to try to unilaterally alter the status quo. Uh, but those are sort of three three practical ideas of, of things that could help push us forward. Jude, back to you. Yeah, just one quick thought. And then Manoj, I wanted to ask you a question. The one quick thought was that this gets back to the information asymmetry here. 
again, as Ryan mentioned, I think it's it's fair and justified that there are criticisms made here in the United States and by you know coalition partners about the consistency of U.S. approach in the direction of travel. On the other hand, if if we're just with some moral clarity looking at who is the destabilizing actor here, there really is only one country that is um, actively threatening uh, a military attack on on a on a neighboring democracy, and that and that is uh, China. Um, and one of the things we noticed in the conversations is um, you, things like a, a a visit to Taiwan by by then Speaker Nancy Pelosi are big, invisible, and easy to quantify, and the media picks it up. The daily barrage of Chinese coercive actions that are omnipresent, comprehensive, um, and holistic to try to uh, isolate Taiwan, uh, to try to isolate Taiwan from its existing uh, international partners um, is harder to communicate. This is why salami slicing in gray zone is, is, is a, an effective uh, political warfare strategy because each marginal action is hard to get media reporting on. And we're seeing, I, I think, real breakthroughs where we have had in, in Second Thomas Shoal, for, in the waters around Second Thomas Shoal, for example, you know, satellite imagery and media on Philippine ships, which bring, or, or if we've had the, the Department of Defense uh, disclosing some of these um, actions by the Chinese uh, Air Force where they're, you know, unsafe maneuvers, that those visible um, clear uh, demonstrations of of what China's course of actions look like. We don't have enough of those. Um, they they're episodic. Um, they're really dependent on uh, um, you know when when the U.S. military decides to put them out, or or when we're fortunate enough to have a a camera crew on a ship that sees the the Chinese you know near near ramming um, other ships. But I think this is this is going to be a really key part of the information space is making sure. Um, that that coalition uh, citizens of coalition partners have a very very accurate understanding of just what stirring the pot looks like, um, uh, because now I think there's a little bit too much of well a pox on both houses you know they're 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 both up to no good where no one in the United States is militarily threatening uh, 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 China in any offensive way uh, Taiwan just wants to be able to travel its path to prosperity and and security. Um, and it is existing U.S. policy and has been consistently that the, the United States does not support Taiwan independence. So really, Beijing is now arguing about a U.S. salami slice strategy. Um, but those that's not proportionate to a uh, China's uh, direct threats of of invading um, Taiwan. Um, that was supposed to be a brief comment. It, it ended up being longer than that. But Manoj, I, I wonder I want to pick up on Yanka's really important point, which I actually think is essential in some ways to the discussion, which is we, we have a very um, limited aperture um, view of what are the scenarios that we uh, as coalition countries would be dealing with. One of them is, of course, the outright, you know, island hopping amphibious invasion. You're a close student, uh, one of the closest students of, uh, of, of Chinese politics and decision making. So I wonder if I can if I can dual hat you. Um, what is your own analytical view of the spectrum of scenarios we need to be thinking about? And, and more importantly, in New Delhi, you're not in New Delhi, but if, if, if in Bangalore and New Delhi, in strategic circles, um, what, are the, what is the band of scenarios that are actively being discussed? Is it mirroring the United States where it's really a focus on sort of a blockade or an invasion? Or do you see a more nuanced discussion of, of what potentially could confront India if, if there was uh, instability in the region? Right, um, okay, interesting question. Uh, I, I wanted to sort of take one of Yanka's points earlier and which resonated with me also, which is the idea that, uh, uh, and which I think Ryan also talked about, right? If, if it becomes this big intractable thing, it's sort of it's maybe a bad analogy, but it sort of reminded me of thinking about climate change. Uh, we all know it's coming. We all know it's going to pro potentially hurt us and it's going to be really, really bad, but we really don't know what to do about it. And we don't know how to set off short-term interests versus long-term. Um, and obviously, there are also ideological divisions on that. Um, so it sort of reminded me of that. And I think where the solutions of that come is when you can tangibly make it worthwhile people to take actions, right? Sectors, countries, companies. Whatever. Okay, so that aside, what is the, in terms of scenarios, I think that uh, in my my view on how Beijing is thinking about this is that, yes, while they are contemplating an entire range of actions, uh, 
I think over the last year and a half, we've seen the status quo decisively shift. Uh, we've seen it take far more aggressive actions. We've seen it normalize far more aggressive actions, whether it is, uh, you know, more, more sorties of jets, uh, whether it is more coercion in terms of disinformation. We've seen it sort of start to shift uh, its gray zone efforts much more aggressively. Um, and I think that's likely to continue for, over the next few years, um, depending on how domestic politics in Taiwan also plays out. Um, from an Indian perspective, I don't necessarily think that this idea of uh, an invasion and the different kinds of invasion scenarios has been something that's been deeply thought of uh, for a long period of time. It's a very recent phenomenon. Um, I think in August last year is when it was reported that the Chief of Defense Staff of India uh, requested for uh, studies into thinking about scenarios. Um, I presume part of those studies are also about thinking uh, of what India can do. Uh, but I have a feeling that some of that might also be around what would be the costs for India and what would potentially be the asks from India from the United States. Um, and I think that uh, while it's worthwhile thinking from an Indian perspective in that sense, I think it's also important for countries around the world, for the narrative to shift in countries around the world from what would be the ask for from us to what can we do because it is it is in our interest to do. That. I think if we can achieve that sort of mindset change, that would be really, really significant. Um, so I think that that's in terms of scenario planning in India, where thinking is going on. I think the military is at least uh, thinking about it. And uh, the fact that they put it out publicly is, I think, important uh, from a signaling point of view. Um, I, finally, in terms of this gray zone contestation uh, and the fact that you were talking about, and the report also talks about this, the need for more information, I think that is something that needs far greater understanding even in India. Because arguably, uh, you know, we've obviously experienced salami slicing, uh, and we continue to experience it. We continue to experience efforts at disinformation uh, and a whole spectrum of actions from Beijing. Um, and it is important to draw parallels, to draw learnings, to draw understandings. And I think some of this has started to happen. Uh, I mean, last year there was a meeting between uh, with, with the U.S., Taiwan, and India discussing something to this effect. So I think that those are the kinds of things that are starting to happen. And I think Indian interest in that is indicating that. Uh, there is far greater cognizance being taken of these challenges. Is it sufficient? No. Uh, it's an, it's a start, is what I would say, uh, which to me is significant because for the longest time, there was no conversation. So I think that's where India is at right now. Um, we've got about eight minutes left. I, I'm going to ask a quick question to Yanka and then Ryan and Lily, um, turn it to you if you have questions for uh, uh, Manoj and Yanka or, or your own sort of comments. Um, uh, Yank, I wanted to ask if you can give us uh, some perspective on um, uh, how you think about this. Is is this about getting individual European states like Germany and France to do more? Do you think this needs to be at the EU level? And if it's at the latter, what what do you expect could come of EU discussions um, on on Taiwan, it's obviously hard to mobilize a massive block of states with varying different interests on this. But of course, I think the signals being sent to Beijing would be stronger if they come at the EU level than than individual member states. But curious, what you see as the the political strategic challenges in moving the discussion forward? Yeah, I would say any of the kind of trade measures, any of the sanctions measures, anything that's related to economic measures can be done and should be dealt with at the EU level. Anything that's dealing with individual military contributions, security contributions, national interest questions will have to be dealt with at the member state level. I don't think that that is necessarily a problem. You know, if the problem is big enough, it will be dealt with by the European side as well. It's all the preventive action that is problematic at the moment. And I wanted to put one emphasis on something you said earlier, just saying, you know, we need to regain that that narrative, the peace and stability, that we're only interested in peace and stability. We're watching a live case of this. We're seeing one of the largest affliction and, 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 and largest um, kind of um, problems for international law at the moment in the Ukraine war. We're seeing such a clear cut black and white case of aggressor, victim, breach of law, very clear, you know, peace agenda. And the peace narrative currently lies with Russia and China in much of the world. They want peace. If only the Ukrainians would stop, if only the Europeans would stop providing weapons, if only the Americans would stop providing weapons. I think we are facing a slightly similar situation here where you, we can obviously say, and I would agree with you, that you know, we can clearly see who the aggressor is in this case, but the fact that it isn't seen that way 
in much of the world needs to tell us something we can't do just more of the same so more of the we're telling you it's different we're showing you the examples um i think it is about this broader notion of regaining um the peace and stability narrative that the west has lost in many of these conflicts and maybe it is about finding kind of cross-cutting um solutions to this or or thinking about this beyond the taiwan case putting the ukraine war into this conversation as well thinking through how we lost the peace and stability narrative in much of the world um how we are not seen as being pro peace and pro stability and how we regain that um that kind of footing back to to uh, lead the conversation because i find that that is one of the, the crucial problems in terms of generating support as well for a question and i do think that in terms of concrete measures that you will see from the Europeans. Whenever the kind of the trade um, and economic interests are affected, you will see actions from the European side. But at the moment, it is sort of signaling right now that you're willing to take additional economic costs at a time where all of your um, economic energy is absorbed by other question is almost a too big ask for a preemptive question. So it needs to be a very concrete problem that you want to solve, a very concrete signaling of a, as a response to a very concrete step that has been taken from the from the Chinese side. So I would say just kind of drawing this down a little bit and drawing some of the parallels, um, seeing that even the fact that Chinese companies are actively supporting the military efforts on the uh, in, in Russia at the moment has not led to massive sanctions on the European side. I do think that that teaches us the lesson of how difficult it is going to be um, in, in generating that um, momentum. And we can have very theoretical conversations about this, but in the end, it is about how do we generate the political will? And I think it is generated through the United States in the end. Great. We're fantastic. Um, so we only have four minutes left. So why don't I just, why don't we allocate two minutes each to, to uh, Lily and Ryan for just their, their closing uh, comments and thoughts, and then we'll let everyone uh, get along with their day. So Lily, why don't I turn to you first? Any, any thoughts or comments to wrap us up here? Great, thanks Jude. Um, I'm left with two with two thoughts and they really, they're captured in our report, but I'm, I'm struck by um, the, the, the greater need for information on two fronts, essentially just more information, uh, more information about the systemic, systemic efforts by Beijing to alter the status quo, influence operations um, by the PRC, you know, we talked in our in our group about creating kind of a dashboard of activities where we could track, you know, whether it's military activities around Taiwan, targeted economic coercion efforts, Chinese disinformation, misinformation efforts, but just more information out there on the salami slicing uh, that you mentioned, Beijing, uh, Beijing that you mentioned, Jude, <laughs> um, and and the ways that Beijing uh, is is itself altering the status quo. I think is 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 one area where more information is needed, and the second is just more information on Taiwan and the history of cross-strait relations. That was really something that struck me from our conversations. Um, this idea of, um, you know, I think I think you you mentioned the scariness, uh, Yanka, and just more information to take the scariness away from discussing Taiwan and engaging Taiwan among not only publics, but also policy elites uh, around the world. Uh, so those are my two main takeaways from today. I'll turn it over to Ryan. Uh, I don't have any profound uh, additions to offer to the great conversation that we've had other than to say thanks. I, I would encourage our, our viewers to read the report and to listen carefully and reflect upon what Yanka and Manoj are sharing with us today. Uh, they're providing honest advice from friends about uh, how the United States is being viewed uh, in the context of these conversations relating to the future of peace and security in the Taiwan Strait. And, uh, you know, the, the fact that, that Yanka felt the need to say that for the United, European Union and concern about Taiwan is more about the United States than about China is a striking statement. Uh, and it's something that we should reflect upon as a, as a country and as a policy community. Um, I, I know that uh, from our friends in Taiwan that they, they have similar concerns about the durability and endurance of uh, American support for Taiwan. We should take it seriously. Uh, and, and we should listen carefully to, to the concerns that are being raised and, and the sources and origins of those concerns. Um, I, I know that uh, Congressman Gallagher is going to lead a team to Taiwan next week. I hope he takes the, the opportunity to listen uh, to how uh, the, the House of Representatives' reluctance to move a foreign aid bill to provide support for Ukraine and Taiwan uh, is being felt and received uh, by people um, in, in Taiwan because I, I think that's an important consideration that I hope we, we take seriously. Jude, back to you. 
Great. Well, um, I want to thank everyone for a really great conversation. Um, also want to thank all of our colleagues at, at CSIS um, who made the report possible. As everyone knows, the the uh, the easiest part is often what, what you see we're doing. Uh, the hard part is all the work that goes into production and editorial and design. So really uh, uh, thankful for everyone. Um, uh, again, the report is on the CSIS uh, uh, website. You'll see it on the, on the homepage. Um, welcome feedback. This is designed to start a conversation, uh, not end one, but, but we hope through efforts like this and conversations with uh, friends around the world that we're going to um, have a chance of, of defining that better path of travel, which uh, achieves our, our national interest objectives of peace and stability in the region, and at the same time, continues to allow space for, for Taiwan to prosper and grow as, as a democracy. So couldn't have picked a better group of individuals for us today, but also just want to thank all of the task force members uh, who spent many hours with us uh, having really good nuanced uh, conversations um, on this just very, very critical issue. So thanks to all of you. Thanks, Manoj and Yanka, for joining us. Thank you, Ryan and Lily, and see everyone at the next uh, Freeman Chair event. Goodbye.